أشهد أن محمد رسول الله حي على الصلاة حي على الصلاة حي على الفلاح الله أكبر الله أكبر لا إله إلا الله Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi Allahu Akbar Allahu Akbar Allahu Akbar Allahu Akbar Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن محمد رسول الله أشهد أن محمد رسول الله حي 
Alhamdulillah. All praises are due to Allah. All praises are due to Allah. All praises are due to Allah. I bear witness that there is no God worthy of worship than the one God, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I bear witness that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is the final messenger of God, completing the long chain of prophets and messengers that we find in God's holy Quran, including Jesus and Moses and Abraham and all the messengers and prophets that we read about. May God subhanahu wa ta'ala's peace and blessings be upon them all equally, inshallah. My dear brothers and sisters, last week at this time, there was about a million of our fellow brothers and sisters gathered in Mecca for the Hajj, as you all probably know. And they engaged in one of the most important and sacred pillars of our faith, that if we are financially and physically able to do so, to go to Hajj, to go at a very special time of the year. And alhamdulillah, the pilgrims that were there and performed the Hajj were invited by God to be there. They were invited to partake in this important ritual. And inshallah, if you have not gone, I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has it, invites you. And if you have gone, inshallah, the, the uh, memory of that period, the lessons from that period still ring true with you today. And it is a good reminder to talk about this from time to time as we as human beings tend to forget. We tend to fade a bit in our faith, fade a bit in our activities, fade a bit in our behavior. So it's important, and this is why we gather, of course, every Friday to remind ourselves. The pilgrimage that they went on was the symbolic uh, uh, retracing of steps that was done by the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and his retracing of the steps of what Prophet Abraham did as well. And the ritual and the symbolism of the occasion and of the, of the, of the process is to be taken very seriously, but they are rituals and symbols, if you will. So when you are stoning the devil, if you will, as, they, as you do on Hajj, it's probably not the actual devil, but it is a symbolism that you are stoning Shaitan for the evil that he brings into the world and to keep you keep your soul safe That the day of Arafah that was last week at this very time was uh, A place where the, where the pilgrims gathered and what Prophet Muhammad said about that particular day Is that he said the day of Arafat is Hajj Meaning that when we go, when the pilgrims go on the Hajj and they did the Tawaf around the Kaaba and they go visit Mina and they go to the different, they go to Mazdalafa, et cetera, et cetera, it all comes down to that day of Arafah. And the question certainly comes is that do you have to be at Arafah to experience hopefully the bliss that the pilgrims experience there in Arafah? And the answer is no that you can also be wherever you are in the world 
and bow and put your head in prostration and be engaged with your faith and be in communication with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala no matter where you are. But of course, there at this holy at that holiest of time, they were there on the day of Arafat to engage, to cry, to be emotional, to ask whatever they wanted for, to to pour their heart out, hearts out. And we pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has accepted each and every one of their dua. Um, there is uh, somebody I know who traveled, who used to live in Jeddah, just outside of Mecca, about an hour away. And he traveled to his home country of India. And when he went to India, he uh, was praying in a mosque there. And uh, there was an old man sitting in the corner who had learned that this, this friend of mine was from Jeddah and had gone to the Kaaba many times and had done Hajj, had done Ummah, etc., etc. And so the old man asked for my friend to come and see him after he was done with his prayer. My friend obliged, went and saw him and said, yes, uh, uncle, uh, how, how can I help you? How can, what, what can I do for you? And he said, bend down, bend down. He was, the old man was sitting in a chair. He said, bend down. And so he bent down. And the man, the old man took him by his head and kissed his eyes, kissed his eyes. And he said, oh, well, why did you kiss my eyes? He goes, I have never been blessed with the opportunity to go to Hajj or to see the Kaaba even. And so I just wanted to kiss the eyes of somebody who has seen it firsthand for themselves, to feel some sort of connection, to feel some sort of engagement. SubhanAllah, alhamdulillah, what an act of deep spiritual faith. And so for those who have gone, don't take for granted what you have gone through. Don't take for granted that God subhanahu wa ta'ala invited you. For those who have not gone, inshallah, God will invite you. God will give you the finances. God will give you the way to do it. Inshallah, you will experience what the pilgrims experienced there. But I want to then sort of then segue into, alhamdulillah, I, I have been blessed to, 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 to go. I went in 2018. And it is a very, of course, deep experience. But let's be clear, it's also a very difficult experience. It's not an easy, especially in the summertime, it's not an easy experience to go to Hajj. The temperatures are well above 100 degrees, 110 degrees. The humidity is well into the 90 percentile. And you are there with a million of your brothers and sisters. And it is claustrophobic, it is hot. And so you had best be there not for the sake of just getting your steps in the run of Kaaba. You should be there not just because, okay, God, this is something I gotta do. You should be there because your heart wants to be there. Your soul wants to be there. I was very blessed to have actually touched the Kaaba. And, you know, before you go on Hajj, there's the thought, oh, this is going to be spectacular. There's going to be a transformation in my soul. There's going to be a transformation in, in my character, etc., etc. And I, you know, I was able to touch the Kaaba, and people, you know, are there on the plains of Arafah. But the reality is, the Kaaba is just a stone. It's just a stone building. The transformation doesn't come in performing the ritual, although that is extraordinarily important, the transformation comes in your own heart, in your own soul, in your own actions, in your own behavior. So while, yes, we go on the Hajj as a pillar, the transformation doesn't happen there. It's cosmic in one respect. It can happen anywhere. And so this is something for all of us as Muslims to realize is that you can make that transformation at any time, at any place, anywhere, and you can elevate your soul. You can elevate what you are 
you can elevate your character. And so it was last week that the du'a was made by the pilgrims on the plains of Arafat. It was last week that now the pilgrims finished their, um, their hajj and they are now on their way back home or not already back home. And so it was interesting that a friend of mine who had gone on hajj uh, many years prior to me, as I was getting ready to go on a hajj, I asked him, I said, uh, sort of in that same mindset, like, wow, I'm gonna get there. I'm gonna, I'm sure I'm not gonna get there and I'm gonna experience it. And you know, there's before hajj and after hajj, I'm gonna be a completely different person and everything. He said, no. Hajj is hard, and I feel like now that I'm back home, now is when my Hajj begins. Now is when I put into practice what I thought I would get from the Hajj. So the, the mentality and the, and, the, and, the, and the elevation in our souls that we are hoping for on Hajj of course happens in many respects and it's a beautiful experience. It is a most majestic experience. But the application of the Hajj comes in our own lives ipso facto, after we've been on the Hajj. And again, you don't have to go on the Hajj. You can move here from Juma prayer and feel, hey, let me take a different tact. Let me do better in whatever it may be, in your faith, in your deen, the du'a that you make, you don't have to go to the plains of Arafat to make the du'a for better health, for better finances, for better grades, whatever it is you're asking for. If it comes from the heart, alhamdulillah, inshallah, it will happen. And in the second part of the khutbah, we will talk about a du'a that was made uh, by Prophet Ibrahim. Uh, uh, when he was building the camp. Could do a lot. Ask Allah for whatever you want. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Wa salatu wa salam wa rasulullah. Wa ashadu an la ilaha illa Allah wa ahtara sharika la. Wa ashadu anna muhammadin abdullah wa rasul. Uh, just an administrative note, or better than administrative note, to my dear sisters and brothers. Uh, right after the Jummah prayer, there will be a new person that will be taking the Shahada, from what I believe, uh, who will be coming back home. And inshallah, if you can stay to witness the transformation of the soul, that would be wonderful. So, <clears throat> as I mentioned before, uh, Dua, the pilgrims were there on the plains of Arafat just pouring their hearts out. As a matter of fact, um, on that day, in that place, the, the Muslims combine the Duhar and Asr prayer. They pray it together uh, because they don't want to miss a moment during that period to make the Dua for that very special time in that very special place. And they pray, and they, uh, when the sun sets is when the period is over, and that's when they move on to the next stage of Hajj, which is Muzdarafa, uh, to collect the stones. They spend the night out under the stars, they collect stones, and they get ready for the next stage, which is to stone the devil. So the du'a that was made then is a very special place, in that very special place. I thought about the, uh, a verse in the Quran where uh, Prophet Ibrahim, Ahmed the du'a that he made when he finished building the Kaaba. So we all know, of course, that Prophet Ibrahim built the Kaaba along with his son Ishmael. And it was built with the express and purposeful intent that it should be the house of God and to commemorate and be the house where one God is worshipped. And that is why we all direct our prayers to that direction, because it is a symbol for the oneness of God. And as it says in Surah Al-Ibrahim, the surah by his, uh, named after him, in the 35th, that's the 14th surah, the 14th chapter of the Quran, 
in the 31st, excuse me, the 35th verse of the, of the chapter, it quotes Prophet Ibrahim's du'a. And Prophet Ibrahim says, Bismillah O oh my sustainer, make this land secure and preserve me and my descendants from ever worshiping idols. Sadiqallahu Make this land secure and preserve me and my descendants from ever worshiping idols. Now, Prophet Ibrahim lived thousands of years before Prophet Muhammad. And I read that verse and I thought to myself, well, wait a minute. How did it go from Prophet Abraham uh, building this house, dedication to one God, to now the time of Prophet Muhammad وسلم, having it be such that there were idols inside the Kaaba? How could a dua of somebody who is one of the most righteous souls that has ever walked this earth, far better than me, you know, uh, all of us, uh, you know, subhanAllah, God knows best, but I'm saying that he was a prophet of God. To have made a dua, and he's not asking for a dua like, hey, give me money. Or oh, Allah, please uh, give me health. Or even, oh, Allah, give me another child. He had been, he and his wife had been wanting children for a long time. And he was built, uh, of course, he had the one child, Ishmael, at that point. He was making a very righteous dua. But within three or four generations of his death, no less, the idols were being introduced into the Kaaba. And all of a sudden, the symbol of the oneness of God now became a place where idols were being worshipped. What happened? A dua from the most righteous soul, not only is it not being answered, the opposite has happened. The opposite has happened. And to be honest with you, this is a metaphor that not just applies as some ancient fable, but I would imagine and I would expect, and I can certainly say for myself, I have made dua, and I'm sure many of you have made dua, and not only does it not happen, but the opposite happens. Oh Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, please help me out of this financial difficulty, boom, the opposite happens. Oh Allah, please help me with my grades, I get a D. Oh Allah, please help me with this issue, the opposite happens. What gives? Why am I being tested that way? And I then continued the thought. And I realized, in fact, Prophet Ibrahim's dua was answered. It was answered with the advent of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. It was answered with the coming of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And now, idols are no longer in the Kaaba, and inshallah, it shall stay that way forever. My point is, is that dua to Allah gets answered on his time, not on your time. You may think, I want this tomorrow, or I want this to be happening right away, and it doesn't happen. Oh Allah, why? Because dua gets answered on God's time, not our time. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows better than us what our needs are, what our situation is, what an impact of getting something would have around with the people around us. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who controls the answering of the du'a. And if a du'a doesn't come true, what do we say? Alhamdulillah. Because it is God's will that has taken precedence over our own will. And not saying that we're asking for anything bad. Of course, we're asking for good things, inshallah. 
but it is something that we also realize that and it comports now uh, with the verse in Surah Al-Balad where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, we have created you into a life of pain, toil, and trial. And in the very next verse after that, it says, does he think no one has power over him? Which I've always, uh, to be very frank, thought very curious. Here you have a verse that says, we've created you into a life of pain, toil, and trial. You expect the next, next verse to say, be patient, have patience, the next life will be better, etc., etc. No, the next verse says, does he think that no one has power over him? Again, another verse you have to contemplate. And one of the things, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best, that when we understand that yes, we're going through pain, the pain of a health issue, the pain of a broken relationship, the pain of some other issue happening in life, the toil, the sweating at work, the trials that are happening in the world, we must realize that we are not in control. Hence the next verse. Does he think that no one has power over him? I don't have the power over my issues. God subhanahu wa ta'ala has the power over my issues. And so the du'a and the understanding that we have, the context, the contextual understanding that we have, we should never lose faith. We should never lose hope that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, despite what is happening in our lives, answers our dua eventually. Look, you are here in a mosque in Los Angeles, and dare I say, you are the answer to somebody's du'a. Young, old, black, white, whatever, you are the answer to somebody's du'a. What do I mean by that? Is that I'm sure our forefathers prayed, oh Allah, may Islam become part of the United States. When the slaves were brought over from Africa, the Muslim slaves that were brought over from Africa, I'm sure, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make, some of them said something about making a du'a, about making Islam part of the United States. I'm sure from those of you from other parts of the world who have immigrated here, you are fulfilling the du'a maybe of your mother or your father or your grandparents that said, give my grandchild or my child a better life. You are the answer to somebody's du'a. So you go ahead and make du'a. Make it strong. Go and sujood. And never lose that faith or hope that your du'a will be answered, to be honest with you, maybe not in this life, but in the akhirah, in the next life. And that, yes, is a test of faith. But as God subhanahu wa ta'ala says, that the afterlife is far better for you, and far greater in duration, and far more blissful, if you will, than this earlier, shorter part of life that we, that we are all in right now. Alhamdulillah. Success will eventually come, inshallah. And so we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to guide us to the straight path. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless our family members who have passed on. We ask Allah to put peace in our heart and tranquility in our soul. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to put his light above us, below us, to the sides of us, and in front of us and in back of us. We ask Allah to bless our community here locally and around the world. And we ask Allah for his mercy and acceptance on Yom Deen. He is Maliki Yom Deen. The comment is Salah. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah. Ashhadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah. Hayya ala salati, hayya ala al-falah. Qad qamati al-salat, qad qamati al-salat. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. La ilaha illallah.
Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Ar-Rahmanirrahim. Malik Yawmiddin. Iyaka na'budu wa iyaka nasta'in. اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين انعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين آمين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والضحى والليل اذا سجى ما ودعك ربك وما قلى ولا الآخرة خير لك من الأولى ولسوف يعطيك ربك فترضى ألم يجدك يتيما فآوى ووجدك عائلا فأغنى ووجدك ضالا فهدى ووجدك عائلا فأغنى فأما اليتيم فلا تطهر وأما السائل فلا تنهر وأما بنعمة ربك فهده الله أكبر سمع الله لما الحمد الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين آمين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم أرأيت الذي يكذب بالدين فذلك الذي يدعو اليتيم ولا يحد على تعام المسكين فويل للمسلين الذين هم عن سلاتهم ساهون الذين هم يراؤون ويمنعون الماؤون الله أكبر سمع الله لما الحمد الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر
Allahu Akbar. Assalamualaikum warahmatullah. Assalamualaikum warahmatullah. Assalamualaikum. Jazakallahu khairan. Brother Omar Rich as he delivered the great khutbah. The topic is on Hajj. Please make it, inshallah, over there whenever you can afford to, to do so. The earlier, the merrier, right? Uh, inshallah, as you leave the masjid, do not forget to help Masjid Umar ibn Khattab as we continue to deliver the services. We need each and every one of you, inshallah, dig in and do the best you can. Allah will come in a hurry to help us in time of need. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward you on that. We have a request, one of the brother named Khalid, Abdul Muqaddim, he is sick, he deserves a dua, inshallah. May Allah give him shifa and shifa al-ajil, not only to him, to other people who are sick and ill in the community, as you hear some people been infected with coronavirus. So inshallah, be careful there, and inshallah, uh, it'll go away soon. Um, also, like the imam mentioned, that there is a brother accepting shahada. Please come forward and take your shahada. What's your name, brother? Uh, Noah. Noah. Noah Abir Jihad Gray. Okay. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Okay, so Noah, you're about to be welcomed by your new family, inshallah. Right? Inshallah, your soul will be now uh, uh, elevated, inshallah. So it's a very simple process. You're just going to say a few words. I'm going to say it first in Arabic. You, uh, I'm going to say it very slowly in Arabic. And then you will repeat it in English. And then we'll go from there, inshallah. Okay? So, ashad, so I want you to repeat after me, okay? Ashadu. Ashadu. Anna. Ilaha. Ilaha. Illa. Allah. Wa. Wa. Ashadu. Ashadu. Anna. Anna. Muhammad. Muhammad. Rasulullah. Ashadu. I bear witness. I bear witness. There is no God. There is no God. Worthy of worship. Worthy of worship. Then one God. Then one God. And I bear witness, and I bear witness that, Muhammad that Muhammad is the final messenger of God. Is the final messenger of God. Allahu Akbar. Takbir. Allahu Akbar. Congratulations. Please welcome the brother with loving arms. He's a new member of the family. MashaAllah. Welcome him home. Do you come with us to the lounge? <laughs> Please, if you have a moment, come and congratulate the brother accepting Islam. MashaAllah, beautiful thing. And uh, as you pray for the, the sunnah, do not forget the brother who, I mean the brothers and sisters who passed away, inshaAllah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive him and reward him jannah, inshaAllah. As-salamu alaykum.